All right, Dr. Elder, uh, my name is Jose Sandoval, and this is my term project. It is a PowerPoint presentation on World War II and the Manhattan Project for History 413. Um, this is going to be about 40 slides, so I'm going to talk really fast. I'm going to go through them really fast, um, and it's going to be about a 20-minute video, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, so, uh, with the events, we're going to start with the events leading up to World War II. Uh, with the conclusion of World War I, uh, the Treaty of Versailles signed into effect. It's very long, extensive, and it really favors the Allies. And there's a lot of countries, such as Germany, that is very unhappy with it. They have to give up a lot of territory. They have to demilitarize themselves from within. And they have to pay several billions. So, Germany during 1920 to 1930 are suffering very... Uh, bad economically, military, militarily, I'm sorry, and territorially. Uh, with Germany at its weakest point, um, a man by the name of Adolf Hitler sees this as a window of opportunity to begin his ascent to power. Um, and this is really when Hitler, who had fought in World War I, is um, probably the angriest person in Germany during this time. <laughs> and he decides that uh, with his political activeness, that he's going to start... Uh, he's going to take the lead of the Nazi party, and in um, 1933, in January, he is appointed a chancellor, and he is going to kill off all the re remaining opposition, and in 1934, he becomes president. Uh, there's a picture of him there. Moving on. All right, so under the rule of Hitler, the Nazi party significantly reinforces itself. Um, as we see, um, 6 million to 1 million unemployment. Um, so he's really putting everyone to work. And another thing he's going to focus on as well is gearing up the country for a war. He's going to expand the military greatly. So at the same time, we're going to see the Axis powers forming, which uh, consists of Italy, Japan, and Germany. Um, with the Tripartite Pact, um, Germany, Italy, and Japan, they all have the same sort of goals, at least, that they can at least work with each other, which is that they want to expand their empires at the expense of their neighbors. And Germany is the biggest of these. And when he invades Poland in 1939, um, France and Britain are going to declare war. And it's going to get very ugly. Uh, in the Western Front, Hitler is reigning terror with his blitzkrieg tactics. Um, he is able to capture France very quickly. And they capture Paris, which is a very big um, morality blow to people everywhere. And in July of 1940, Britain is the last major line of defense in Europe. They are barely hanging on. They're getting bombarded every single night, but they're holding on. Um, in the Eastern Front, uh, Hitler betrays Stalin with Operation Barbarossa. Uh, in the largest military attack uh, in world history, which is a 3 million personnel invasion of the Western Soviet Union. It's a huge victory for Hitler. However, it is stalled in 1941 because of the winter that comes in, slows everything down, and so there is a stall there. They're not able to yet capture Moscow. Um, the Holocaust is also going on during this time. And it's a very terrible uh, dark period in history, as we all know, with the final solution that was determined in the Wanna See Conference in uh, 1942. Um, gassings, shootings, random acts of terrorist disease, and starvation leads to the loss of about 6 million Jews. So, very terrible. Uh, this is a picture from Auschwitz, as you can see. Alright, so World War II in action. Um, the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and Africa has, sees uh, Italy desperately trying to um, fight for territories there, but they're not as strong as Germany. This is also when Winston Churchill refers to them as the weak underbelly of Europe. So it's pretty um, disappointing to Hitler, and it's pretty embarrassing for them, and they need help conquering even Greece. They can't even conquer Greece, they need help with Germany on that. And this is going to be a weak point that we, later, that we see later in the war that is definitely utilized by the American military when they invade uh, the Axis powers. Um, the Pacific, uh, Japan wanted to initially join forces with Germany to fight the Soviet Union, and, but with the non-aggression pact that Germany signed 
with the Soviet Union. They decide we're on our own. Uh, for a long time, they've already been invading China, but they're in a gridlock there. So they decide they're going to go southward and attack a bunch of Pacific islands for their resources. In 1941, however, they're going to attack Pearl Harbor, uh, the United States, because we put an embargo on them, frustrated them, and they decided we're, they're going to go to war with us anyways, so we might as well destroy their battleships before they're able to use them against us. This is the last straw for the United States, and we're going to go to war with them after that. Um, the Allies plan their approach. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting moment during the war. It's a very crucial point when we're deciding what we're going to do. And, you know, this is a point in time where in when I was in school, when I was in history class, we would just go on with the war and the military campaigns that um, went into fighting in Europe, the Mediterranean, and Africa, um, and the Pacific. However, I'm going to switch gears here and start getting into the Manhattan Project, and we will get back to the war later on. So, major scientific breakthroughs are made in Europe. Ironically, a lot of these discoveries are made in Germany, but we're going to talk a little bit here about why uh, the Germans weren't able to um, take this from us. Um, and um, so as you can see, there is a lot going on with the research on on uh, nuclear energy and how it can be used as a chain reaction to create a bomb. So the reason why Hitler and the Germans aren't able to utilize all this research is because Hitler has effectively politicized the education system in Germany and with things like the Aryan physics movement he sort of turned society against research, scientific research and stuff like that. We also know he was Catholic and stuff, so it's a very, very missed opportunity for Hitler. But um, um, a lot, and, and, and what's even funnier than that, is a lot of those um, physicists, such as Albert Einstein, Leo Slizzard, Fermi, all of those guys, they're going to go to Britain or they're going to go to America. So that is going to help the Americans. Um, aggressing, against incredible odds and modest goals and effort, Germans begin the work. And their work is not very good because they don't have military backing, they don't have leadership from Hitler, and they don't have the support of their society. So it's literally these German physicists who are getting together with one another and starting these clubs. They're called clubs. And they're trying to figure things out, you know, but they, they, they can't because they, they don't have enough support. And in 1942, the biggest blow to this whole program is that they determined that even if they were able to create a bomb, it won't be until after the war. So Hitler just scraps the, the idea and the effort entirely. Okay, so the Manhattan Project originates um, greatly with the Einstein Slizzer letter in uh, 1939. Um, Einstein and this other professor, uh, Leo Slizzer, they are starting to see the research and starting to see the potential of this atomic bomb. And so they write a letter to FDR who listens, he actually listens. And Roosevelt in 1941 signs Executive Order 8807 which begins the Office of Scientific Research and Development. So this is, again, this is only one uh, office of many that are going to sprout. But as you can see already, um, Roosevelt is taking initiative, he's taking leadership, and he's actually going to back, um, he's, going to, he's going to use um, his leadership to push an effort. He's going to push this effort so that we can actually try and actually create a bomb out of this. Um, so, uh, in 1941, with Pearl Harbor, there's, of course, a new sense of urgency. And there's going to be these new senses of urgencies all throughout this effort. There's going to be D-Day, there's going to be the Bataan Death March, there's going to be so much going on in the war that is influencing us. And these scientists and physicists, these physicists are just feeling that pressure. So they're working as hard as they can around the clock. You're going to see a lot of projects built, a lot of towns cleared, a lot of acres used, a lot of private companies and, and 
and contractors hired to help with this, it is a huge, huge endeavor. So, as we see here, they're discussing uh, the budgets. Um, they're all going to get blown away. <laughs> They're just going to use so much more, so much more, and so much more as we keep going. However, you can see here, these are the techniques that we're looking into with Uranium-235. Um, the thing about Uranium-235 is that it comes from Uranium-238, and it needs to be split apart from it. It needs to be separated from it, which is very hard. On top of that, it is also a very scarce resource on the Earth. So we're going to see how, how, it is, uh, how we attain all of that. Um, electromagnetic separation, gaseous diffusion, thermal diffusion, and we're going to try using that to separate the uranium. Heavy water and graphite are going to be used to uh, run the nuclear reactors. Um, however, I should also mention, the Germans also failed significantly because they tried using heavy water, which as we know today, graphite is so much better. There is another theory, though, that um, a man by the name of Eisenberg who was chosen to lead uh, the crucial part of um, the nuclear reactor running and stuff, chose heavy water. And uh, based on the book that I re uh, read, uh, Heisenberg's War, um, there's a historian who sort of theorizes that maybe he threw the game on that intentionally. And, and, and a lot of people claim that he was smarter than to have done that. So maybe that was another reason why Germans failed. So, Problems around the bomb design concept. Uh, these are very, very formative years. A lot going on right now. Um, there were still many unknown factors. Um, 235 was relatively unknown. No reactor had been built. So uh, the project finally gets its name in 1942. They decided to call it the Manhattan Project. And this is really when they're deciding, like, this is going to be a huge thing. The size of the endeavor was unprecedented and is going to require an incredibly large budget and effort. And the thing that they need right now is a rating. They need a top rating. And they need, um, the ratings are how the uh, American government and budget and stuff determine how important something is. Um, so they need to get a better rating and the person that they're going to get to do that for them is Leslie Groves. General Leslie Groves is able to get them that rating. There's another guy who was supposed to lead it, but he couldn't do it for them. So they get Groves uh, in there and he gets it for them. Groves also chooses Robert Eisenheimer to uh, lead a very essential part of the project. And we're going to see his name come up a lot more as we go on. A collaboration with uh, Britain. This is sort of um, interesting because Britain, um, <clears throat> way back, was able to help America initially. They were the first ones to start research and stuff. So, but by 1943, America takes the lead. And this sort of starts a feud because Britain wants to help America and, and America um, wants to help Britain as well. And they sort of want to exchange information. But again, this is a very sensitive topic. So what ends up happening is as America takes the lead, they tell, they tell Britain, hey, we hold all the cards. We're, we don't even really need you. And that's when Churchill um, signs the uh, March, uh, the Quebec uh, Agreement with uh, FDR and um, Canada as well, which is sort of an agreement that's like a little bit of bargaining and sort of determining, um, delegating how they're going to go about it. But as we see, they're definitely all going to help each other um, a great amount. So Oak Ridge, Tennessee is a very huge part. Um, Oak Ridge, Tennessee is where they're going to build reactors uh, as part of the Clinton Engineer Works, um, and production quickly begins. They're able to start creating enriched uranium-235 there. And so, and the reason, uh, going back to it, the reason um, that it's going to be in Tennessee is because of the Tennessee uh, River, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which uses the river to power uh, hydroelectric power to to um, to fuel the um, gen the reactors the nuclear reactors uh, Chicago is also a place that has a large lakes and stuff and they're gonna have they're gonna have actually the first uh, nuclear reactor is created under the um, Briggs uh, football field at the university and so there's um, a lot of um, uh, discoveries being made there. Uh, Hanford, Washington is also going to have reactors. As you can see, um, these places are all 
having the same thing, which is creating uranium so that it can supply this bomb. Um, and as you can see, uh, the, the Hanford site is uh, right by the Columbia River, so it's also using hydroelectric power. Um, so as we can continue here, uh, British Columbia is sort of focusing on heavy water. So they're going to help us out too with heavy water and research and stuff. And Los Alamos, uh, finally, um, the biggest of these. Tennessee, uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Chicago, Hanford, Washington. All of these places are creating enriched uranium. And it's all going to end up going to Los Alamos where they're actually assembling the bomb under Oppenheimer. And that's why it's so important. And these other bombs are going to focus on the thin man, the fat man, the little boy. We're going to talk about some science now. And this is a picture of the site. Um, the Manhattan Project. Essential resources. They need uranium. They're going to use that for the bomb. So there's three major deposits, the Belgian, Congo, Northern Canada, Colorado, USA. However, the Congo is a little bit messed up right now because it's flooded. So what they're going to do is go in there, reopen it, and buy it. You know, as we can see, these are major efforts and they're making a lot of progress. Uh, problems with uranium. Uh, uranium is, um, again, it needs to be separated. And so the way they're going to separate uh, 235 from 238 is using electromagnetic separation, gaseous diffusion, and thermal diffusion. And as we're going to see, uh, a lot of, all three of these are attempted at Oak Ridge, which again is, goes to how big the, the project is there at Oak Ridge. Um, in 1942, uh, Project Y-12, Y-12 through is uh, electromagnetic separation. And they're going to use a magnetic field to s try to separate it, which does yield a lot of, um, uh, yield a lot of good results. Um, and so as you can see here, uh, with collaborative efforts, um, again, they're going to start uh, producing enriched uranium for the bomb. So the next one is gaseous diffusion. Uh, the most effective, but it's the most difficult, and they, they too are going to start producing uh, enriched uranium through um, through uh, Graham's law and, 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 and the projects there. And so the last one is thermal diffusion. Uh, thermal diffusion um, is uh, another process to um, create enriched uranium, and with the thermal diffusion, um, they're going to get a lot of uranium produced as well, enriched uranium. And so this is how it's going to happen. Uh, this is the S50 project of thermal diffusion. So that's going to be the first stage of enrichment. Then they're going to send it to the K25, which is the last slide that we saw. Then they're going to send it to Y12, which is the electromagnetic. So it gets refined more and more and more as it goes. And at... Um, in 1945, uh, July of 1945, they're able to create 110 pounds of 89% enriched uranium and 235, and that is put into Little Boy. So as we go on, uh, you can see plutonium was also decided. They wanted to create one out of plutonium. However, there are some problems with that. Um, um, let me see here going on. Uh, the separation process uh, for plutonium, they separated using a fluoride process and they were able to do that effectively. However, the problem with it is that um, they were designing Thin Man with it. And they realized that the plutonium was going to make the bomb unstable and it just wasn't going to work out. So um, they decide to scrap that idea and instead opt for another tactic, um, which is the, sorry about that, um, so we're going to go ahead and end this video and I'm going to have another video for the rest of the presentation.